Ladies and gentlemen, let's give it up for Petros Curtis and Art Venture Productions. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, what well an incredible ensemble. Let's give them another round of applause. Petros Curtis and Art Venture Productions. It's a great honor to have them here on board the stunning celebrity apex Petros Curtis featured in the opening ceremony of the Greek Olympics in Athens in 2004. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Giuseppe Moschella. Welcome aboard the stunning, the glorious Celebrity Apex. Hope you had a wonderful experience so far, and we're very delighted and very honored to have you all on board for this memorable event. But now, ladies and gentlemen, this is my greatest pleasure and honor to welcome here on stage the Vice President of Marine Operations of Celebrity Cruises. Ladies and gentlemen, Captain Manolis. Thank you. Thank you, Giuseppe. Wow, how do I follow that? Honorable Ministers of Tourism, Your Excellencies, esteemed members of the press, dear guests, good afternoon to you all. On behalf of Celebrity Cruises, our President and CEO, Ms. Lisa Lut of Perlo, our Royal Caribbean Chairman, Mr. Fain. On behalf of our Captain, Captain Dimitrios Kafejis, <laughs> our Hotel Director, Niazi, <laughs> and our amazing 1,000 crew members. I would like a big one on them. <laughs> it is with great pleasure and honor that I welcome you on board this magnificent vessel, Celebrity Apex. I am delighted to welcome you today as the very first official guest on board our latest ship in the fleet as we prepare to start her inaugural season out of Piraeus on June 19th, sailing the stunning and iconic Greek islands this summer. I will show you around this groundbreaking ship after your meetings today and explain both the design inspiration that has gone into her unique architecture and also the sustainability initiatives and innovations on board and across our fleet. The ship you are standing on here today is a great example of how innovation, partnership and planning can make dramatic improvements in sustainable cruise tourism, including many initiatives to reduce emissions. I know my team on board will demonstrate our unique celebrity hospitality to you today and make your short visit special and memorable. But before I hand across to the leaders here today, our very own uh, leader, our president and CEO of Celebrity Cruises, Ms. Lisa Lutov Perlo, would like to extend her welcome and say a few words. Thank, Thank you, Manolis. Manolis. Honorable, Honorable Ministers, Ministers of, of Tourism, Tourism Secretary General, General Lika Polosvili, and, and dear guests, guests. It, is it is an, an honor, honor to have you aboard Celebrity Apex today. We're delighted and proud for this opportunity in cooperation with CLIA to host the UNWTO event on our beautiful new ship. We're also very grateful for the leading role the Greek government has shown in the gradual and healthy return to cruise operations in Europe. I would like to thank Minister Harry Theoharis and UNWTO for their proactive and constructive approach in allowing resumption to happen and for making today's event possible. Cruising offers an incredible opportunity for the destinations we visit with guests from multiple nationalities making a big impact economically as they explore your stunning coastal regions and islands. In that regard, we are excited to have our flagship Celebrity Apex home porting in Athens and we are deeply committed to our partnership with Greece and promoting sustainable tourism in the region. Greece is the birthplace of our brand, originally the Chandras line, and the reason we still keep the X for he, 
So homeporting our ship here has significant meaning for all of us. I know you've spent a lot of your week so far discussing the opening of tourism and how we can do so in a sustainable way. These topics are very close to my and our chairman Richard Fain's heart. Oceans are 71% of the planet and 100% critical to our business and to generations to come. Conserving their health is of paramount importance. At Royal Caribbean Group, we have clearly defined environmental goals, working in partnership with WWF to set them, and they are aimed at reducing our environmental footprint in three key areas, emissions reduction, sustainable sourcing, and destination stewardship. My colleagues would be honored to discuss any of these in more detail while we are with you here today. I hope you have a productive and successful meeting and enjoy your tour and time on our beautiful ship. Captain Demetrius and Hotel Director Niazi and their amazing crew are honored to have you as their guests. Thank you again for your support in restarting travel and tourism and to the UNWTO for choosing Celebrity Apex as the host for your afternoon. Thank you everyone and have a wonderful day. Manolis, back to you. World Tourism Organization, Mr. Zurab Pololikasvili. Yeah, Captain. We all would love to go somewhere if you can arrange this trip. I remember one year and a half ago when, with dear minister, dear friend Harry, we planned this uh, commission. Initially, it was planned to do it at the boat. I was. He told me that let's let's make a first cruise conference at the boat. Okay. So even this morning, I was thinking that we will go at the small boat where we will have 20 of us with three or four uh, members, captain plus two or three members from the cruise. So it's really impressive uh, where we make this first conference uh, for a very, very important part of tourism sector. I'm very happy and very proud to organize first time ever with CLIA with such uh, important our partners, and we have here our uh, dear friend and partner, Pier Francesco, many thanks to be with us. To all people who are working here, but especially it's important why, because we truly believe and we agreed yesterday that we are at the stage when tourism will recover and we will start. And same for cruise business. It's very important. As we all know, 3,000, around 3,000, person they are working on this uh, cruise and it was very hard I can imagine this one and a half year for everyone and especially we always our recommendation was to support private sector and I think that this is the very nice and uh, timely place to restart uh, cruise tourism. Cruise tourism I truly believe that started in Europe in Greece from the Argonauts so now uh, I fully agree with Capitan that uh, with innovation, and this is innovative way to support sustainable tourism development. Uh, so I'm very happy that all of us, we are here, we, we have numbers of ministers with us uh, today, and this will be the starting point to restart tourism. And again from Greece, uh, from Athens, we just came from uh, residence of uh, Madam President, and we all agree that these are historical day after pandemic, restarting tourism and rebuilt and recovered tourism uh, in, first in Europe, and Europe always will be the example for the rest of for or for other regions. So many thanks to give us space and place to be part of this very important uh, meeting, and uh, wish you all successful. Uh, day we had very uh, interesting session this morning. We had quite important participants. Clea is again very big actor, 
and player in the cruise uh, cruise business, and I'm sure that this autumn, as we planned, we can organize such big and important ministerial level, level meeting first time in Miami to continue this dynamic. And for us, it's also a pilot and first time we are organizing um, conferences or meetings uh, regarding uh, dedicated uh, cruise tourism. And wish you success and wish all people who are who are working at this cruise, other cruises and in the industry to recover as fast because everything and most important thing are people this covid show us and most important thing are jobs so we're fully committed we'll fully support unfortunately UNWTO was very far from cruise industry and cruise uh, sector tourism sector uh, these are first steps of our relationship and i'm sure that we can do many things together thank you very much and thank you for your warm hospitality It is with great honor and pleasure that I would like to invite now on the stage the Minister of Tourism of the Hellenic Republic, Mr. Haris Theoharis. Well, there goes my plans for my speech, two things I had of interest. Otherwise, it's speeches that tourist ministers make. Very boring. But two interesting things I had to say. One, Lisa revealed already that the X stands for Handris. It's, um, it's he in, in Greek. We don't pronounce it X, but he. So the Handris family is one of the pioneers of uh, cruising worldwide. I, I would say. And the second is that cruising started in Greece, and you revealed that. It's, it wasn't the Argonauts, actually, not that bad. <laughs> but of course, Andreas Podamnianos, the Andres family, those pioneers that started the actual industry that we stand here much uh, shorter than them, men of great uh, value, um, that were able to see much further than a generation, much further than uh, perhaps even a lifetime. Um, <clears throat> so, so now I guess it's the boring part. I have nothing else to tell you. Um, but I think Your Excellencies, Honorable Mr. Zura Polilikashvili, General Secretary of UNWTO, dear friends, really, you are Your Excellencies, but you're also friends after so many times that we have worked together from around Europe and around the world as well. Dear honorable and distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very, very happy that as these two hectic days slowly, slowly draw to a close, we're able to um, do so in such a beautiful, beautiful setting as this ape. I'm not sure if it's a good name, actually, Apex. Does that mean that anything else you might do afterwards is going to be less than this? This is it? Ah, there's going to be more, huh? <laughs> but normally Apex is the high point, and uh, now you're going down here. No, no, it really is. This is something that I haven't seen. I haven't ever, ever seen. And I congratulate you for this. And I feel honored and privileged to um, unwrap it effectively. <laughs> it took the bubbles out. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, I will, um, you know, the cruising industry will uh, never cease to amaze me. We stand, the Greek government stands side to side with the cruise industry. I think you saw this uh, today when we met the Prime Minister um, here, Mr. Vago. Clear can depend on Greece, as you could depend last year, 
when it was very, very difficult even to restock and refuel and dock, even docking was an issue of concern. And of course, as we try to restart this uh, very, very difficult, uh, um, leaving the very difficult period behind us and restart with uh, renewed optimism. Um, I'm very glad that we were able to create together with you, with your experts, those protocols, um, together with experts from other countries, but Greece took the lead, that allow the trust that is so much needed in the tourism industry to come again. And the cruising industry, unfortunately, lost 90% of its revenue loss. Um, as uh, the Secretary General knows very well, because they produce a lot, a lot of the statistics, Tourism in general lost about 75%, but the tourism industry was more hard hit than the rest of the industry. They lost 90% of the revenue. They lost um, hundreds of thousands of jobs, more, more than 200,000 jobs um, throughout the world. So the social and the economic impact was huge. And we all stand here together um, as we're ready to welcome ships again in Greece uh, to restart. So we acknowledge the need to adjust to a new reality. We have to do that. Also to adjust in a short period of time and also to obtain timely data and information. This is something that we feel it's currently sorely lacking. We are also aware of the industry's need to cope with major challenges, such as the obligation to abide, abide by and assume the cost of new environmental regulations by 2030 and by 2050, at a period of significant economic losses. So we have to see how we can time those changes correctly. We also recognize our need as policymakers to have a clear view of the economic environmental and social impact of the tourism industry on our destinations to monitor and manage tourism flows because this discussion was very very pertinent before the crisis dubrovnik venice and other destinations were beginning to question the need for cru uh, um, cruise tourism at least the need for the kind of cruise tourism that we had in the past all those challenges are here before us, but I think we're also stronger in order to overcome them. And in order to do so, we need more information, we need more data. I saw, we talk about how much do tourists leave at the local destination. And I always hear this 60 euros, 60 euros per outing. And I'm beginning to, to suspect or even believe that those numbers are numbers that we have not revisited for a long time. Those numbers are extrapolations. Those numbers are numbers that we, we, we get something from the Caribbean, Wondershed's paper there, something from the Baltics, something from the UK or from Asia, and then we sort of make some assumptions and make adjustments. Those are not necessarily real numbers. We need to be transparent about the costs, but we also need to be uh, correct about the benefits as well. That's the only way that we as policymakers can make the right decision. So we understand that local communities have concerns that uneven tourism growth, rapid expansion of coastal and maritime tourism may in fact have limited contribution to the well-being. If that's true, it needs to be addressed. If that's not true, it needs to be rectified in their minds. We have to educate them. And we have to tell them that this is not true, that you are actually seeing the benefit without realizing it. So those vulnerabilities and those benefits have to be um, addressed. So what are we deciding? What do we do about it? Well, we have discussed long and hard with the Secretary General, with Alessandra Prianda and her team on what can be done. And we decided that the best way to address this is to create a research and monitoring facility under the auspices of the UNWTO. Why? Because UNWTO has extensive knowledge 
on the SDGs, on the methodology that um, we should apply in order to um, measure and monitor all those uh, parameters and the key performance indicators. With the uh, coordination of our ministry and of the Greek government, in an area that's very hot again, if you like, I think the, the pendulum has swung, and please correct me if I'm wrong, from the Western Mediterranean towards the Eastern Mediterranean in uh, uh, this year and perhaps even the next few years. So an area that we have to um, get more information and more data on the effect of tourism. So UNWTO's expertise on the field is ex extensive and we acknowledge the lack of statistical data measuring the three dimensions of sustainability in tourism. So, and UNWTO has the support of the UN Statistics Division to help us in that respect. So we will work together with CLIA, with the UNWTO, with the academia, with universities, and of course, anyone else, other governments and the private sector to ensure that we get the data that we need to plan on the private side, the planning of the companies and uh, depend, on that, that depend on that data, and of course on the policy side to ensure that we um, make the right decisions for the years ahead. And at the same time, to plan and understand infrastructure needs, um, educational needs, whether we have the right people to be able to support the kind of experiences, excursions, uh, crew members, etc., that are required for the industry, and also to understand the other parameters like birthing systems and uh, um, control systems, flow management systems that are required if we are to increase the kind of experience that uh, tourists get. Because ultimately, the goal is, is common. People to be able to come to a destination, people to appreciate the destination, and people to want to come back to that destination. Because what's the point in cruising and seeing five places and seeing them under circumstances that don't allow you to appreciate? So I'm very glad that we will be able to um, create this important facility, but I'm also glad because um, our friend, the Honorable Minister from Saudi Arabia, Ahmed al Khadib, has decided that we could extend the remit of that maritime monitoring facility to perform similar tasks for the Red Sea. Saudi Arabia has focused a lot on increasing its tourism um, industry as part of its economy. Uh, and as a result, it also has a lot of concerns about the impact of this uh, quick increase. So this monitoring facility will be able to provide valuable data for the East Mediterranean, for the Red Sea, and perhaps if other countries wish so, for a wider area as well. So I'm very, very glad to everyone that worked very hard to make uh, this a possibility. We had great discussions this morning about the three aspects of sustainability of maritime tourism, of um, social, economic, and environmental. And when I say environmental, I also mean cultural, not just the environment as such, but also the cultural environment that can be easily affected by, by tourism. So all those three aspects, I think those are aspects that we could as uh, I think we touched upon uh, Mr. Vago last night, we could think about how to discuss them in a more regular fashion, uh, somewhere in the vicinity, I'm not saying necessarily in Greece, but um, in the Mediterranean, because I think it's an important subject and a subject that we should not let go as the technology, the impetus of the clients, of the tourists are gonna be strong, and they're going to be forcing the changes to actually accelerate rather than decelerate. Thank you to all, and thank you for making this possible.
Thank you, sir. I would like, and now I would like to direct your attention to the high-tech screen for a wonderful message from the President and CEO of the Cruise Lines International Association, Ms. Kelly Craighead. Secretary General, Honorable Ministers, Captain Manolis, and dear special guests, CLIA is honored to be hosting this important event today. I'm particularly grateful to our global member, Celebrity Cruises, for making it possible to hold today's proceedings on board this magnificent ship, the Celebrity Apex. The Cruise Lines International Association, or CLIA as we're more commonly known, is the leading authority on global cruise. We represent the wider cruise community, which is made up of the many small, medium, and large enterprises that support cruise tourism, including travel advisors and travel agencies, ports, destinations, tour operators, and a wide range of business partners and suppliers, in addition to our cruise lines, who make up 95% of the total global cruise capacity. As we all know, the global health emergency has rocked the very foundation of the travel and tourism industry, and this is especially true for the cruise segment. However, I'm pleased to say that cruising is gradually resuming in key markets around the world, and we're following strict health and safety measures that have proven effective even before the introduction of vaccines. On behalf of the cruise community, I want to express our sincere appreciation for the collaborative and collective efforts of governments, including the Maritime, tourism, and health ministries represented at today's event, which we've, who have supported us and continued the safe and responsible resumption of service. If there are silver linings to be found as we manage our way through this pandemic, one thing is for certain, which is the value we've placed in the relationships we've developed and strengthened with our public sector partners at all levels. We look forward to continuing to build and support these important ties. While we continue to weather the COVID-19 pandemic and advance a measured return to service, it's important to know that our members remain committed to being responsible leaders in tourism. For the cruise industry, this means making continued advances in environmental performance, as you'll see firsthand today on this beautiful ship. The Celebrity Apex is one of the many examples within CLIA's fleet that's focused on decarbonization and innovative environmental best practices as well as a focus on destination stewardship, which includes the commitment to working closely with the stakeholders in the destinations we visit to help better manage tourism flows. I know you'll learn much more about CLIA's priorities from our global chairman and the executive chairman of MSC, Mr. Pierre Francesco Vago, in his remarks that I know are to follow. In the meantime, I'd like to congratulate the UNWTO and the Greek Ministry of Tourism on today's announcement about creating a research and monitoring center for sustainable coastal and maritime tourism. I'm delighted that CLIA can support this important initiative by contributing our research expertise to complement the center's findings. Our aim is to help the UNWTO to develop a holistic view of sustainable coastal and maritime tourism. The ability to capture and collate data and analysis is vital to all of our shared interests. Just a personal note in closing, I want to express my sincere regret for not being able to join you in person today. I truly miss seeing my old friends and the chance to make new ones, but I know our paths will cross again soon. Until then, we will continue to work together with you and others and direct our sector towards greater sustainability and inclusivity. Thank you again for joining us today for this important event. I would like uh, uh, now to invite on the stage the Secretary General of the Greek National Tourism Organization, Mr. Dimitris Fagakis. Impressive ship, Hamtel. Honorable Ministers, Honorable Secretary General of the WTO, on behalf of the Greek National Tour Organization, 
I welcome you to Greece. Your presence here these days is a strong message to the world for the restart of tourism in our country and the beginning of a new era in international tourism industry after the pandemic. I also would like to welcome all the distinguished guests and thank them for the honor to be here with us in our country these days. It's a decisive moment for Greek tourism. The choices that we are going to make today will create the future. Last year, with collective effort, we kept the tourism industry alive. The biggest challenge ahead is to mark this year as a milestone for the recovery. However, it is important to acknowledge that the long-term restart of Greek tourism will take time, will be gradual. The day after will be a chance for reforms and change in four important sectors of Greek tourism, sustainability, special identity and authenticity, safety and digitization. We need to collaborate, governments and the private sector in order to achieve better results for the local and national economy and the people who work for the sector. We are happy with the restart of cruise travel in Greece. It's a really crucial endeavor for us, and we make it happen with the collaboration of the cruise industry and the Greek government, especially uh, our minister, Haris Theoharis, uh, and the Ministry of Maritime Affairs. I would like to congratulate Prime Minister, you, Minister, you, and all your team for all these efforts. The goal of developing a sustainable tourism model all year round that will also multiply the benefits for local economies and the society is a challenge we can win. The crisis has been an existential threat for too long. We choose to turn it into an opportunity. We must and we will embrace the challenge. Thank you and welcome to Greece. Our next uh, esteemed guest, the Global uh, Chairman of Cruise Lines International Association and Executive Chairman of MSC Cruises, Mr. Pierre Francesco Vago. Welcome on stage. Sir. Minister, Secretary General, honored guests, it is a privilege to be here with you today, once again able to meet and discuss matter in person at this important event during the 66th meeting of the UNWTO Commission for Europe. Secretary General Polikashvili, I thank you. It is even more special to be able to do so in your spectacular country where all around us we can take in the richness of Greek culture and amazing scenery. This is truly a reminder that travel is one of life's greatest pleasure. Greece and the Mediterranean region are at the heart of our industry re-emergence from the pandemic. You were one of the first countries to achieve an early resumption of cruising, and we are extremely grateful to Minister Toaris here today elected Prime Minister, or it was on behalf of Prime Minister Mitsotakis and the rest of the Greek government for your cooperation and unwavering support. So thank you very much, both of Thank you for everything you've done. Also, I might add in recognition of the key role that we play within the overall tourism sector. The cruise sector has worked with governments, health authorities, and ports around the world to develop enhanced health protocols that are enabling a safe and responsible return to service. More than 500,000 passengers have sailed on clear ships since last summer, and our protocols have proven effective in making cruising one of the safest holiday options, if not the safest. 
Last year, the global pandemic completely shut down the entire travel and tourism industry. Many coastal communities lost overnight the huge economic benefits that our ships bring. As a result, the occasional voices of concerns about cruising have largely disappeared, and these communities are now championing an urgent and sustainable return of our cruise ship. Contributing to the sustainable development of the destination we visit is of paramount importance to all of us. Cruise lines engage with destinations around the world, sharing experiences, planning future itineraries, and identifying new experiences for visitors to protect the culture and the heritage of popular destinations. Here in Greece, we partner with the cities and ports of Corfu, Heraklion, to help them capture the social and economic benefits of tourism while safeguarding the long-term sustainability. We are leading the way, helping destinations manage visitor flows, for example, through birth allocations, we mentioned this morning. As other countries, Greece would benefit from a system to book mooring slots. The cruise industry has often invested in the development of local infrastructure to help visitor flows, such as the installation of additional lift to, ac to access the city of Santorini. This, despite only representing less than a quarter of the visitor of this popular island. Our approach has been considered a model for the entire tourist sector. Our partnership with Dubrovnik shows how authorities, communities, and the travel sector can work together towards a common vision for responsible tourists and preserve the cultural, cultural heritage. Our MOU has helped establish Dubrovnik as a model of sustainable tourism. We recognize the road cruise destinations are unique, and we look forward to partnering with other municipalities to ensure a harmonious and mutually beneficial resumption of cruise operations. We can find practical solutions to better management of tourist flows through a constructive dialogue and close cooperation with local communities. Together, we have an opportunity to do things even better than in the past. As an industry, we are always focused on the future. The post-COVID phase presents an ideal opportunity to rebuild sustainable tourism in a collaborative manner. UNWTO's initiative is a demonstration that dialogue and actions are possible. As we gradually resume operation, we are building back better and more sustainable. And despite the challenges, we remain resolute in our commitment to responsible travel and tourism just as we always have. Cruising is one of the world's most innovative industries, especially when it comes to developing advanced environmental technologies. Year after year, we pioneer new technologies and solutions in cooperation with world-leading scientists, manufacturers, and shipyards. We have already invested more than $23.5 billion uh, in ships with new technologies and engines that can run on cleaner fuels to reduce air emission and achieve greater energy efficiencies. But we have to recognize we are part of a system where shipping represents only around 2% of global greenhouses gas emission, and cruising is a tiny fraction of that emission. Our investments need to be mirrored by industry in general to succeed, for example, by ensuring that those cleaner fuels are available at the scales where ships operate. As Europe sets out its ambition to become carbon neutral by 2050, I can tell you today that our industry also shares the same long-term vision. We're pursuing net carbon neutral cruising in Europe by 2050. We look forward to working towards this objective with European Union institution. The EU Green Deal is important and we want to contribute to its success. But let me be clear, to succeed, the EU Green Deal should be truly focused on generating green growth. For fully sustainable coastal tourists, this means a need to develop clean alternative fuels and other technologies that will allow us to achieve our common carbon neutral vision across the whole of Europe, including the more remote islands and coastal communities. We must never forget 
Tourism is an economic powerhouse that can support global green efforts representing 10% of world GDP and jobs. Maritime and coastal tourism is an essential part of these sectors, with cruising contributing $155 billion to the global economy. So CLIA can only applaud the leadership shown by UNWTO for the global tourist community and how tourists can play a major role in achieving the UN Sustainable Development Goals. We would also like to congratulate the Greek government again for establishment of the first sustainable coastal and maritime tourist research and monitoring center here in Greece. There is no better place for it as one of the most popular and most beautiful countries in the world for this type of tourism. So it is uh, therefore with greatest pleasure that I, on behalf of CLIA, pledge our support today to the UNWTO for research into sustainability and coastal maritime tourism in the Mediterranean. We look forward to continuing our long-standing cooperation with the UNWTO as we chart a course together towards the sustainable development of travel and tourism, and most importantly for us at CLIA, the cruise industry. So, Minister, you will get your data. This is a promise that I make in front of everybody. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for being with us. And ladies and gentlemen, let's give it up for Pier Francesco Vago. What an immense pleasure is having you here on board. Grazie mille, Pier Francesco. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to welcome here on stage our editor-in-chief of CNN Greece, Sofia Mavraza. Dear Minister of Tourism of uh, the Hellenic Republic, dear Secretary General of UNWTO, Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you to the ministerial panel of the High Level Conference on Sustainable Coastal and Maritime Tourism in the Mediterranean, Challenges and Opportunities in the Post-COVID-19 Pandemic. A very big thanks to the hosts, CLIA and Celebrity Cruises, that give us such a unique opportunity to be here on board Celebrity Apex. And what a magnificent cruise ship with state-of-the-art technology. We are about to witness a lively debate, or better, a unique learning discussion on the importance of maritime and coastal tourism, on how we can learn from, from leading destinations, on the strategies to secure a sustainable future. I can find no better audience than you, and for sure, you are as excited as we are to hear from the leaders of the industry, our distinguished ministers and tourism leaders. At this point, I am honored to welcome to the stage the participants of the ministerial panel. Haris Theokharis, Minister of Tourism of the Hellenic Republic. Please. Jurab Pololikasvili, UNWTO Secretary General. Glendi Klozi, Minister of Tourism and Environment of Albania. <laughs> Savas Perdios, Deputy Minister of Tourism of Cyprus. Hello. Orit Farkas Akoin, Minister of Tourism of Israel. and Rita Marques, Secretary of State of Tourism of Portugal. <clears throat> During this meeting, our esteemed panelists will have the opportunity to provide us with their own experience of developing the coastal and maritime tourism, and most importantly, their vision for the future. I believe it can be a very positive one, given the strong commitment to sustainability our excellencies have. But before beginning with this ministerial panel, I would need to call to stage Ms. Alessandra Piantre, Director of UNWTO for Europe, to brief us on the main outcomes in this morning's discussion as Sustainability Dilemmas Parallel Series.
Thank you very much, Sophia. How is everybody doing? Good. My boss was complaining to me and he told me, you bring me to this ship and then we have to sit and talk. And I told him to trust me and at the end of the day, it will all be my fault, so it's okay. So I would like not to be too boring, but I think it's very important for Sophia's discussion with such a, a high level panel that we feed in with the very interesting debate that we had in the morning, where according to the three areas of the one concept, which is sustainability, and of course I'm talking economic, I'm talking environmental, and I'm talking social, our esteemed panelists contributed by highlighting some of the challenges that we had ahead of us. So my job here is to give all of you and Sophia some food for thought. Economic uh, discussion. First of all, we spoke about we need to go from recovery to innovation. So we have no time. We're going straight to the bottom line. We need to speed up the process of sustainable investments. And next destinations to, should arise to diffuse the expenditures. Both Kelly and Helen spoke about the great amount of investments that are being done, especially infrastructure, ship, vessels. By the way, today I learned that this fantastic ship, like any other uh, ship and boat, are called she, which is amazing. So finally, you know, we have, this is really the place to be for all of us <laughs> women. So the economic footprint of the cruise sector is essential for a wider actual ecosystem impact. And then we have to focus on sustainable ways for travel and aviation and stronger ties between aviation and the coastal maritime tourism sector, because obviously most of our destinations, starting from Greece and obviously all the Mediterranean, but everywhere are reached upon by normally by plane. So an integrated view is absolutely needed. From the environmental side, remote working will contribute to a fundamental change for the islands and they're building a more sustainable form of tourism. That's interesting. They call them digital nomads, but in reality, many people have changed their lives because of remote working and they didn't go home to work. They went directly to islands and beautiful destinations. Interdependency between cruise industry and a wider ecosystem, which includes workers, shipyards, guests, and locals. The role of technology into making transportation more efficient, reducing energy and water consumption is number one as a priority and sustainability has to not be a cost, but an investment for and to the survival of our environment. And last but not least, we're in uh, the location that probably has the most number of islands. Am I wrong? So interconnectedness of islands destination is crucial in order to ensure environmental sustainability also helps protect the nature of this destination. The social part. Minister Thoharis mentioned a couple of times, it's crucial for the community's longevity. We have to protect, and we recently launched very interesting initiatives at UNWTO, specifically with the Al Ola uh, inclusive community framework. I'm very sad that Minister Al Khatib left together with Pier Francesco Vago, but this is actually, we launched our study on inclusive community. Whether it's rural destination, whether it's island, what is very important for social sustainability is that communities are being part of the game. That we're not just visiting a destination, but the actual people that live in the destinations are the ones that embrace all of us. The social impact of tourism is definitely underestimated. And tablets. And locals sometimes bear the cost of tourism, but do not profit from, from the benefits. That, in general, is the feeling that they have. But tourism is definitely crucial for island economies, and diversification is easier said than done. And we have to intervene. Thank you very much. Have a fruitful discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandra. So let me waste time no more. My first question comes for Mr. Thoharis. Which are the perspectives of coastal and maritime tourism in Greece in the post-COVID era? Do you think there are possibilities for Greece to expand in this section? Uh, 
okay, I think. on. Okay, that's great. Uh, thank you very much for this question. Um, of course, coastal and maritime tourism, the focus of today's um, discussions and, and the whole of the day's events um, is particularly suited and pertinent for Greek tourism. Um, Greek tourism is, in a sense, peculiar in that um, for other countries, they have an issue of tourism in the big cities, like over tourism, etc. In Greece, it's, Greece is not known for its big cities, Paris, London type of uh, thing, but mainly for its islands, mainly for its coastal areas. So this is the strength and the core um, that we have. Uh, that's, that's the number one thing to take into account. The second, of course, is variety. We have 227 out of 6,000 roughly islands which are inhabited and are very, very different in their nature. And the third is that um, um, during this crisis, uh, the need for seclusion, the need for protocols and the kind of trust meant that um, yachting and cruising seem to be um, uh, areas of focus. Greece has a lot to offer, but also a lot to uh, fix and, and, and do better, mainly in terms of infrastructure uh, and the management of flow. So, uh, it is a, an area of focus for us. Last year, we passed a, a new diving law to, to even make it better, to create diving parks, etc. cetera. Um, yachting, you cannot find a single yacht in Greece this year. It's amazing. Everybody's like snatching them and uh, you know, trying to stay in a bubble with their families only or with their friends only, etc. So that's also another area of interest. And cruising already, we mentioned how, how important uh, the, the resort has been, Greece has been for the resort of cruising. So yes, we have, there's a lot of potential uh, for this, like there is a lot of potential for it in the whole of the Mediterranean. Thank you, Mr. Kolharis. And Mr. Kololikasvili, the post-COVID era has already begun. Could you please tell us what the UNWTO considers regarding the future of tourism and what these days uh, tourist As I mentioned, uh, this is the first time we are as close with the um, cruise industry and cruise tourism industry, let's say. Um, it was really a pleasure and honor to have such a great and strong partner like PLIA is the research we are offering. Again, this is the first time we are organizing uh, with the leadership of Ministry Minister of Greece from Greece and uh, for us it's something pilot so and we saw that that time at the first eight nine months cruise tourism uh, was affected much more than normal tourism of course all the world was closed but especially it was like a island and isolated from from the from the uh, tourism industry and immediately we started to create to be ready to restart the cruise uh, tourism um, with the protocols, which was created by crisis committee, again, under leadership of uh, our dear minister. It was something new for us, like the normal uh, protocols for hotels, for other touristic destinations. And I think, and we are very proud to be the part of uh, that very hard and very difficult times. We created and we support it with this, with the hope and with the full support to the people who are working. I mentioned uh, before that most important was to support people who were working at the uh, cruise ships. They lost their jobs during one and a half year, like other people who were working at the hotel industry. But it was very important to support them uh, financially. Liquidity was a uh, very important part. And uh, I think, thanks to many governments, they could manage to support the, the companies. And we are here. I'm uh, very optimistic that cruise uh, tourism will restart the same uh, time like the normal tourism. I don't want to split, but this is something specific, something different. With vaccination process, I'm sure. And uh, we already saw that many islands opened first, then other 
traditional destinations like it was mentioned uh, where one and a half year ago all of us were discussing and talking about over tourism now we have absolutely different uh, situation but we see that cruise tourism step by step is uh, coming back and uh, again this kind of meetings this kind of uh, connections give first of all hope to people who are working in this industry and we're really very happy and committed to restart tourism and this summer will be absolutely different to compare with the last summer and especially for Mediterranean countries where we are now and uh, let's see so what do you think that uh, what is the today's tourist seeking in uh, generally speaking as we mentioned many times, uh, the things are changing every day. We are very important days when green certificate was uh, announced. Not only announced, it works already. We, we saw today the first uh, examples. Seven countries already launched, and with the time in next two or three weeks, I'm sure that other EU countries will join. Uh, and it will work. At the same time, vaccination process is there. And again, it gives us hope that as we mentioned yesterday, that it will be a nice showcase and example to, I don't want to use the word in copy-paste, but for non-EU member countries, we have half of this whole, uh, the countries who represent, for example, Israel, which is not a part of EU. That means that this kind of cooperation give us, and our role is and um, responsibility is to restart tourism as fast as it will be possible to use now nice showcases and in this case you um, um, green certificate which is not only solution can help the restarting tourism but this is the process with vaccination with this kind of new digital passports or applications plus protocols we are trying to connect different regions i think uh, will give us a hope and uh, realistic approach to restart tourism uh, this summer. It's a long process, we know that uh, not easy, but we are doing every day and I want to thank to all ministers to be so collaborative, all governments to support this process and it depends on all of us. Only one country or one region can uh, restart tourism uh, in short uh, period, so that's why this kind of collaboration and communication is important. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Brazil. Mr. Closi, do you see coastal and maritime tourism as a main area about Albania's development in the future? Yeah, thank you very much. For sure, the people outside is waiting from us to say in which moment this ship will start moving because everybody is waiting that the tourism will start. But anyway, we need to talk for our policy for the future, for the future. But in Albania, it's uh, more than clear that the tourism is just not, for the moment, on one of the main industries of our country. But at the same time, we are trying to transform that in one, uh, let's say, a good guru, which speaks for the better life. We need to change our life even through tourism. So I'm really glad that the Minister Harris invited us all here in this very significant uh, symbol of uh, so much investment that the tourism sector is doing even in the close time of the pandemic. Talking about Albania, okay, uh, Albania is a small country in this area, but right now we are trying to promote our country like uh, a touristic area and also trying to be part of all the region in our uh, Mediterranean uh, area and especially in the Adriatic Sea. For that reason, the Prime Minister Edirama has mentioned that the tourism needs to become the main pillar of our economy. And at the same time, we have start making a very clear understanding of the importance of blue tourism or the tourism is coming from the sea area. So uh, in Albania, we are trying to make, uh, let's say, the role of the smallers or the people which are just entering in the industry and not making the mistake that the biggers has made. So. We are trying to invest in the, uh, this industry, uh, trying to create Albania like the free, uh, or let's say like a country which is very friendly with the environment. And all the industry that we are trying to build in the sector of the blue tourism needs to be according to the European Greek deal. And so we are pushing uh, maybe the building of 
four to five new uh, marina in a country, and all this marina needs to be 100% uh, equal to the European uh, rules of strict European rules of the environment. So our idea is to create a new industry in the country, to create a new industry in Albania, uh, just not like a competitor with our colleagues. But uh, I am here on behalf of my government to to give always the message come from the Albanian government that in, in this sector we can be competitors, but more than competitors, we need to be allies. So it's very important that uh, in a meeting like this one, we'll share the same opinion, creating the same philosophy, and also trying to see our small part that we are living in the Adriatic and the Mediterranean compared to the big world that we are living, like a place that uh, we need to create industry, and I'm really support with uh, General Secretary say that this industry is not just more a pleasure. Okay, we are in a, ple in a very nice pleasure space here, but this is an industry first which uh, keep in work 1,000 persons, and the industry in our region takes 100,000 persons work, which uh, during these last two years has suffered a lot. So I'm uh, more than optimist that uh, the moving of this ship is a good sign that all the industry will move and uh, we'll all declare a good life for our citizen, which is waiting for us, not just big policy, but just to move ahead. And it's unfortunately still in our office, the debate is that if we are going in a beach with masks or without masks. Thank you, Mr. Strozzi. Mr. Perdios, my next question is for you. Do you consider the Mediterranean region suitable for the coastal and maritime tourism in the post-COVID era? Cyprus uh, strategically investing in this kind of tourism before the pandemic. What are the plans for the day after tomorrow? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Before I start, I'd like to say thank you uh, to our dear friend Harris for uh, the organization, the invitation. Uh, for getting us all together, I think it's very important um, and it gives a strong message um, everywhere. Now, with regards to Cyprus, uh, if I may, I would like to start where uh, the Secretary General finished your question earlier. You asked, what does the tourist of today want, or the visitor of today, the guest? I think what has changed in the last few years, not only during the pandemic, but before that, uh, it's just the pandemic made it faster and more visible. I think uh, people now, they don't just want to visit things or places, they don't want to see things that are just uh, static. It's not enough now to offer somebody uh, the opportunity to go see a church or um, a particular monument, uh, cultural... The experience, so, the experience. Exactly. That is the word I was going to get to. And uh, people want an experience that is going to stay with them for life. And an experience, uh, most likely, that um, is very uh, active uh, and uses as many senses as uh, possible. So what Cyprus is doing at the moment, yes, we've been extremely successful over the past uh, decade, especially um, in uh, taking advantage, in the good sense of the word, of our coastal areas. Um, we've developed um, four or five uh, world-class uh, marinas. Uh, we now have two ports and um, two other parts of the island where uh, cruise ships can dock. And uh, actually, I think we've developed our coastal areas um, as much as possible. And uh, now what we're doing is trying to give something back to the rural communities as well, um, the mountain areas as well. And uh, how do we do that? We are a small island that has everything. So within an hour and a half maximum, you can reach the furthest point of the island, even uh, from any of the ports uh, we have. So, yes, coastal tourism and maritime tourism is the entry point into Cyprus, but um, we are now trying to get people from that entry point further uh, inland. And uh, maritime and coastal tourism has a huge role to play. It will continue to play that role. But uh, actually, because uh, things change and uh, travelers want more from their stays now, um, we try to bring the inland and uh, rural experience as well as part of the coastal. And I think there's a lot of interest there. It's a very interesting project for us to um, undertake. And uh, this is something that um, we want to 
um, support cruise lines with as well. I'll tell you a bit more about that uh, later if you want. I don't want to take up too much of the time, but I think cruise lines uh, also have a role to play in uh, our vision on how we want to combine the coastal areas with the inland areas. Thank you very much, Berlioz. And uh, I want uh, to ask uh, now Mrs. Parkas at point. Which are the challenges experienced on maritime tourism during COVID-19 for Israel? And which are the opportunities to foresee? Which are the challenges experienced on maritime tourism during COVID-19 for Israel? And which are the opportunities to foresee? Thank you for your question. And I want to also extend uh, my great uh, gratitude uh, to uh, Your Excellency, the Minister uh, Harry and uh, the World uh, Tourism Organization for uh, putting together such an amazing event that made us all remember what's the purpose of tourism, uh, uh, why is uh, health, mental health, and the importance of bringing uh, all the tourists back around the world so uh, Israel has big plans with regard to uh, cruises and maritime tourism, some of which were suspended during COVID-19 here. We expect the ship, including uh, this one, to uh, come to the ports of Israel uh, this coming September. We are waiting and uh, expecting it. I think that Israel is a vision uh, that can be a very sustainable, uh, basic and port and point of attraction for many lines of cruises uh, uh, internationally because of many factors. First of all, Israel is uh, totally healthy, it's totally COVID-free. Three days ago, we even uh, canceled the last limitations within Israel. People do not wear masks outside. Hotels are resort, gyms, our restaurants, our cultural things, our cinemas education system is all back to normal. We're gradually bringing in vaccinated tourists. So for that to open up, I think we have a great uh, opening position. Secondly, we have great infrastructure of port, modern port in Haifa in the north. We have three uh, points uh, of connection that can uh, become a very strategic hub for many uh, cruise lines who want to have sustainable uh, ports to come in. Uh, that can rely on their services uh, and, and, and that. And third of all is the connectivity. Third point is the connectivity of Israel. Israel has an amazing uh, connectivity with regards to airlines, to flights. Uh, I think that in that regard, it is another advantage for uh, cruises and uh, maritime tourism. And adding to that is, you know, only uh, in the last year we have signed a normalization agreements with the Emirates, with Bahrain, with Morocco. And that only as it in itself added a nearly 130 new flights per week coming and entering uh, uh, Israel. And in that sense, my wish and my vision is that we will become a hub of uh, cruise lines and uh, so on. And uh, we have a lot to offer. People can go off the... the the ships do all these uh, experiences and the uh, variant uh, uh, places to go. We are the Holy Land, the cradle of three religions. We have history, modern all together. We have uh, Jerusalem and we have beautiful desert. Truly expect to be the first uh, uh, big uh, cruise line that is expected in September in the ports of Israel, and we are committed to assisting in any... Thank you very much. It was very interesting. The world, uh, the world uh, hub for your vision. <laughs> uh, so, Mrs. Marquez, with your former experience in investments, uh, please tell us how important, important is for Portugal to invest in coastal and maritime tourism. Thank you so much for the question. First of all, let me uh, greet and salute again my dear friend Harry for welcoming us. It has been a great day and thank you so much. And of course, dear uh, Zuraf, thank you so much for putting all the effort to resume tourists um, as rapidly as possible. And thank you again for my, my fellow peers and friends to, to be here. 
So going back to the question, um, yes, you know, uh, we are talking about resuming tourism and uh, it's all about money, isn't it? Um, uh, and of course, investment really plays um, a, an important role here. So as far as Portugal is concerned, we have been invest investing in maritime uh, tourism industry, not only as far as infrastructures are concerned, so a lot of good examples here have already been mentioned in several countries, so we do have to, we do need to have infrastructures for, for, the, for the ships, of course. But also, uh, it's important to say that infrastructures are very much uh, need to be brought in the sense that when people, for instance, ar uh, arrive in a, in a port, we need, you know, mobile infrastructure, we need, you know, all the, the surroundings infrastructure to be um, elastic enough to accumulate all the traffic jams that will pop up in the, in the cities. And, um, and of course, investment is, is important, not only private investment, but also public investment from the government. I would like also to highlight the investment that we have to make as far as um, you know, uh, crew are con is concerned. So people, uh, we have been uh, tackling very much uh, our investment in people because tourism is, is about money. Yes, it is, but it's also about people, meeting people. And we already mentioned you know, that the new trends in tourism, people like to discover new sites. Yes, it's true, but they also, they, they tend now to discover uh, people or experiences instead of sites. So that means that we have to nurture, invest a lot in in training and um, and reinforcing all the the, the skills, not only um, in the private uh, industry, so meaning in the crew and staff, but also for the ones that work in the stores near the ports, in the cities, in the municipalities that need to be able to welcome everyone that's visiting um, the, the 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 surroundings. So in, in order to put it short, in a short way, uh, I would say that yes, investment is important. In Portugal, we have been outlining a, a, a very ambitious strategy for tourism for a couple of years now. So everybody's talking about sustainability and that's very good, but we at, in, in Portugal, we have outlined a very ambitious plan uh, for tourism four years ago, and that has uh, pointed out sustainability as our biggest priority. And, um, and so um, be even before the pandemic, we were working with this, with this agenda in a, very, um, in a very attentive way. And for this to happen, in order to, for us to, be, to, to have a more sustainable approach as far as tourism is concerned, we need to involve private investment and public investment. And this is my, you know, my message. So when we are talking about investment, we have to gather all these contributions, not only you know, public policy, uh, from the government, from municipalities, from all the public organizations, but of course to invite private partners to jump in and, and to, to contribute to a, to a better tourism. So, Mrs. Marquez, uh, what is the role of the national authorities of the destination involved to ensure that the maritime and coastal tourism activity is in benefit of the environment? Well, the role is huge. Um, the role is huge. So, basically, um, all of us are here we we we, um, we are responsible to establish uh, public policies right and and so we have to define uh, a roadmap and we have to define the goals that we need to attain um, at the end of the day and um, and in order to to uh, to attain these goals we we need to uh, we need the private sector to to be aligned so how how did you how how we import, so how can how did we manage this situation in Portugal? So again, back to our strategy. So when we outlined our strategy four years ago, we open up a huge discussion, a broad discussion involving private and public sector, in order for us to be aligned when defined when defining this roadmap. And this is quite important because we have to buy in the strategy; otherwise, people will not care about it. And, um, and so the role um, in, the, in the public sector is to define the way, yes it is, but when defining the way we have to guarantee that the other parts, the private sector buys in the, the goals, by, by, so they identify themselves with the goals and that they understand what the role have to play in order to meet the goals. And, um, and of course 
um, the government has another role to play. Uh, in, apart from settling um, the goals, it has to put uh, incentives in order for the private sector to meet the goals. So you need to establish incentives, fiscal incentives, uh, you know, for financial incentives, no matter, wh no matter what, in order for the private sector to follow and, and for us, at the end of the day, um, um, uh, so we need to be able to, to, to monitor and to conquer these objectives. Uh, otherwise, you know, it makes no sense to have a strategy. So we need to, you know, to feed up, to feed up the momentum um, in, order for, uh, in order at the end of the day to, to deliver. And, and so monitor and deliver and having the right incentives for all of us to be aligned. Thank you very much, Mrs. Marquez. Uh, Mr. Polulikas, really, uh, what is the biggest opportunity that the pandemic has served concerning sustainability and which is the role of maritime coastal tourism? What is the biggest opportunity uh, that the pandemic has served concerning sustainability and which is the role of maritime and coastal tourism? Sorry. No, I, I'm wondering, uh, what uh, is the biggest opportunity that the pandemic uh, served concerning sustainability? Okay, thank you. In tourism. Uh, I will continue uh, Rita's part. I think investment was very important part during this pandemic. I think many countries, like private sector, at the same time, the governments, they're starting to invest. And they use many countries, I mean, not all, all of them, but we have many uh, nice showcases when the countries and the private sector use these lockdowns. Sometimes it was difficult to make some new constru constructions or to open up, but uh, it was really good time and it's still good time for investments for sustainable development. Again, we had uh, quite uh, difficulties with uh, over tourism and it was mentioned many, many times. And now we have opportunities to start from the scratch to restart tourism and to use i mean it's not a good way to use but at the same time it's an opportunity to restart tourism in a sustainable way many destinations uh, like it was mentioned especially in europe had quite big problems with the cultural heritage with the flows of tourism and traffic of tourists now at the last and past lessons it's easy to restart and to um, continue to build the, the sustainable uh, development and sustainable way uh, of uh, tourism, uh, especially in European cities and uh, countries, especially in the uh, Mediterranean uh, area. So um, uh, we, just before pandemic started, announced 2021, like a year of rural development, we thought that and we still will be focused and uh, we just launched yesterday uh, the activity which we call the best uh, tourism villages and uh, we wanted to support to create new destinations or upgrade the existing ones and we saw just after opening the borders it was june last year that people starting in europe especially um, traveling domestically to discover new uh, places to travel outside of big cities and concentration of tourists. And I think it was very timely. It was a coincidence, of course. We didn't know that pandemic would start. And now we want to continue and to support uh, new destinations and especially rural development. This is another opportunity to create new jobs, to support people. The idea is to support uh, uh, destinations to develop, but at the same time, to support them with innovation, with education, and with investments. This will be three components we want to boost and to support and push uh, in uh, rural uh, part of all countries. Again, Europe will be one of the best nice showcases. As you know, a part of Europe, we have other four big continents, but we want to use European experiences and European know-hows to export to other member states. There are huge of opportunities, a lot of things to do, again to attract uh, new tourists, to create new destinations, at the same time to have sustainable development. This is a wonder, 
great chance and great opportunity for many countries, for many regions, and um, as we announced yesterday, we want to support and step by step to develop forests. Also, it's uh, a pilot and first time we're doing such kind of uh, development, so I really hope that um, um, this is a chance to man for many people, many families, and I will be back a little bit uh, to cruise tourism uh, in uh, many small island countries. Last one and a half year was quite difficult and quite hard, especially for families who are, uh, whose income was from cruise tourism. We will look at uh, from the casinos and from the restaurants and from the concerts, but imagine that people who are waiting for cruises coming because this is only in income for uh, their families. So, and nobody cares and there was no responsibility to support them. So I really hope that with restarting uh, this industry, many families and many people will survive and will have income in very uh, next uh, few months. Thank you very much. Uh, and I want to ask uh, Mr. Uh, Theoharis, how can we secure that the financial benefits reach the local communities of the destination in concern? You're right. This is a very, very important question um, because a lot of the resistance that we have been seeing is because there is a perceived lack of spreading of the benefit. Um, the fact that um, the cruising is, is a very capital intensive industry. A ship like that probably costs about a billion US dollars. Um, so th this is 1.1. So this is not something that can be uh, created by small and medium enterprises. And you know very well that the, there is an inherent um, mistrust of the public towards larger enterprises. And it, it's, a, it's a question that we get all the time. That's why I think it's very, very important. Um, Cruising helps the local community in many ways. First and foremost, of course, uh, the people that go out, come out to uh, shore, uh, they buy products, they, they eat, they go on excursions with local people, etc., etc. Of course, there is a responsibility uh, for the uh, cruising companies to allow this exchange to happen and not to sort of close in in terms of the way that they conduct uh, those excursions. This year, it has been proven very difficult to do so because of health concerns. So the, the sort of bubble which has to flow from the ship to the island ashore means that the companies are very selective in terms of who we do, they do business with. And that creates a, a huge burden. So what we have been asking the companies to do, <coughs> and I'm very glad to say that all the companies have obliged, they have cooperated very well, is to source locally, to buy more local produce and bring more of the island in the ship. They, no they normally do it up to a point, but of course we ask them to be a, a bit more forthcoming this year in order to balance uh, the fact that they have to, for health concerns, not cooperate with everyone uh, and um, partner with everyone on the But the important thing is, and, and I think that's, that's an often overlooked factor, is the fact that, especially for long haul, uh, long haul traveling uh, with the uh, airline is very much tied to cruising, a lot of it. Um, we have a record year in terms of the number of flights, direct flights uh, from uh, the US to Greece, and this is matched with a record year of home porting. So those two things are not unconnected. So what happens is that a Chinese tourist that wants to come to the Mediterranean, it's a very unfamiliar territory for them. So they can venture out much more easily by taking a cruise because they, feel they trust if they've tried it uh, uh, somewhere else in Asia, then they can trust that they can do it as well in the Mediterranean. So they come to the Mediterranean through the cruising, they see the different destinations, 
and then they feel confident enough to come again. And you see that especially customers that go for the first time in a, in a destination through cruising, 50% of them revisit afterwards as tourists, uh, land tourists, as it were. So, so those are all different aspects of the kind of benefit that local communities can expect to, to reap through their engagement with uh, cruising uh, uh, tourism. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to ask the same question to uh, Mrs. Farkasa Cohen. Uh, how can we secure that the financial benefits reach the local communities of the destination concerned? That's a great question, and I think that in that sense, Israel, uh, the fact that uh, is totally COVID-free allows us to maximize the benefits to our uh, local economy. Uh, since I expect and wish that many of the cruisers would stay and uh, give their uh, guests a few days to enjoy Israel and not only to use the harbors and the ports as a opening points to other destinations. So I think the best thing is, first of all, to go and travel uh, domestically. And, uh, the fact that we are COVID-free is a great advantage because uh, vaccinated uh, guests on the ships will be able to go down and travel and go uh, north of the country and uh, uh, south of the country and so on. And of course, if we're talking about the harbor itself and its services, it uh, gives jobs to uh, you know other employees within the ports and within the infrastructure of the port so that they can be a part of the marital tourism in uh, that sense and uh, you know i was happy to go in when i went into this ship i saw uh, israeli uh, people uh, managing the security on the boat so <laughs> we also export i think our unfortunate expertise in Israel has many challenges that we are uh, good uh, doing. We know how to do well, so I think that in that sense we can offer security services, safety of the passengers, and, uh, and maybe also collaborations, international co collaborations. I think that uh, if we uh, combine together countries that are uh, around the Mediterranean, and that would be the natural uh, course of these uh, uh, maybe cruises, we can uh, make uh, one plus one uh, uh, bigger than two and uh, offer, you know, joint uh, trips uh, around our countries and so on. Thank you very much. And Mr. Perdios, how important is for uh, Cyprus to invest in coastal and maritime tourism? Well, obviously, um, it's very important for us to continue to support uh, an industry that uh, has spent a lot of money, uh, a lot of investment uh, to build itself up. So let's not kid ourselves that uh, we as a government, as a country, are able to, from one day to the next, um, come and say, hey, you know, uh, everything needs to stop. Yes, things need to improve. Um, we, as well as the, as the private sector, are committed to doing what is necessary going forward, even if that means calculating uh, the cost of tourism, so that then we are able to mitigate uh, what goes um, back into the community. But uh, yes, it's absolutely important to continue investing. Uh, we are what we are today because of uh, coastal uh, and maritime tourism. And this is something that uh, we will uh, continue to protect. And what is very, very important in terms of sustaining uh, this type of revenue uh, for the island, from a sustainability point of view, it's not just enough to talk about the environment. We want to understand exactly what the cost of tourism is, what the cost of offering those services at coastal areas are, or, or is, the cost is, so that we can then be, uh, um, be able to um, bring back into the community uh, whatever is necessary on top of that. 
And at this point, I want to add to uh, what Orit and uh, Harris uh, said with regards to um, spreading this uh, wealth. And I want to give you two examples of what we have done in Cyprus. As I said, we have two ports and um, two docking areas, all four managed by uh, different companies. And what we have started doing now, even though it sounds a bit strange, um, we get all these, these four players at the same table when we are discussing the arrival times of cruise ships, for example, so that we are sure that not all the cruise ships go to one port only. We make sure that they go to different ports um, across the islands so that more communities can get that benefit. And also another thing that we have done, um, which again is quite strange uh, because it's not normal for the public sector to get involved with something like this. Normally it's uh, the private sector alone. We have actually, as a ministry, gotten involved with the type of excursions that are being offered by the cruise ship. Traditionally, for whatever reason, uh, cruise lines haven't been uh, particularly good at knowing exactly what the destination has to offer. And uh, they have depended a lot on local companies to offer those itineraries. We saw that the same itineraries were always uh, used or promoted. So as a ministry, we got involved with that. And we said, look, this country has this, 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 and this area. Make sure that uh, when you're here, you're sending people to different uh, areas. So uh, this is very important. Thank you. And uh, last question for uh, Mr. Closer. Um, what are the plans for the day after tomorrow on maritime and coastal uh, tourism for Albania? Plans for they are to see uh, what we'll do tomorrow. Uh, so what I want to say is that it's very important to, to go in the same line with all our, all our colleagues from the region. We created a common network of the maritime business in Albania. Our plan uh, for the coming future is to create an Albania legislation that needs to be very, uh, very competitor with uh, the other uh, countries. For example, we put, uh, we're just trying to, to use even our opportunity that we are part of the region, but still we are not part of this uh, strict rule of European Commission. And for example, we put zero taxation for the yacht and speedboat be registered in the Albanian flag. Unfortunately, the pandemic which has been in the last year, but uh, we have started creating a, a new flag, uh, a new uh, Albanian flag, which is uh, with zero taxation for all the country in the world. And so in the same time, we are trying to move ahead with both speed. So first with legislation to create very attractive legislation, uh, even compared to the other country in our area. And secondly, to go uh, straight forward with the big investment. And the project of the Prime Minister Derama is to create a package for 10 billion euros investment in the maritime business. And so we are planning to invest in Albania for infrastructure of tourism. Like as mentioned, four new ports, uh, mar let's say marina, and also two new airports, which are near to the touristic area. So to create for the coming decade, a very uh, magnetic uh, situation in Albania for investment in the tourism in all sectors. As, as mentioned, we are, in, we are living in the Adriatic Sea, we are living in the Mediterranean, very well known logo of tourism, but in the same times we know ourselves, we are near to the strongest, like the Greek tourism is. And so we are trying to create in our, uh, in our area a new business which is dealing more with the nature and the beauty of uh, the nature. And so uh, just to go even uh, in the same parameter of the sustainable developed goals, our job is to create a tourism which is dealing much more with the environment than ever else. Thank you very much. Thank you. So at this point, the time is up. And as the ministerial panel has completed, I would like to thank all esteemed participants who had tight discussion. I think that it was a very interesting journey for uh, all of us and made us uh, eager to travel again.
thank you for your efforts uh, to restart tourism. Thank you for, your, uh, for the opportunity to be here. Thank you for such an honor to converse with you. I am pleased that I met you all. And as we say in Greece, istoi panidin, until we meet again. Thank you. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, let's give them all a massive round of applause. Now, ladies and gentlemen, in a couple of minutes, we will be beginning with the signing ceremony, which will be the most primary important event of today's. We wanted to thank each and every one of you for joining us in here today. And before we get started, ladies and gentlemen, we wanted to inform you that at the end of today's presentation, we will be uh, taking you on a tour around this majestic vessel. We're going to be dividing you in three different groups, and you will be able to experience, as Mr. Perdios said, you'll be able to experience our spectacular product, Celebrity Apex, of, of course, Celebrity Cruises. But now, ladies and gentlemen, it is my greatest honor to welcome here on stage the advisor to the Minister of Tourism of Greece. So, mesdames et messieurs, ladies and gentlemen, let's give it up for Antonia Tomea. Honorable ministers, dear guests, ladies and gentlemen, the World Tourism Organization and the Ministry of Tourism of the Hellenic Republic recognize the importance of systematic monitoring of the impact of coastal and maritime tourism. It is in this context that they are willing to combine their efforts and work together in the establishment of a research and monitoring center for coastal and maritime tourism in the Eastern Mediterranean region. Of course, this center will run under the auspices of the Ministry of Tourism of the Hellenic Republic for measuring, monitoring, and advising on policies for the sustainability of coastal and maritime tourism in the Eastern Mediterranean. Two inspirational women who lead by example will elaborate on the scope, mission, and the vision behind the establishment of the research center and monitoring center for coastal and maritime tourism in the Eastern Mediterranean. The first is Professor Chrissy Vitsilaki, Rector of the University of the Aegean, that will serve as academic partner in the Research and Monitoring Center. Professor Vitsilaki completed her undergraduate studies in sociology at Trinity College, Hartford, and received an MA and a PhD from the Department of Sociology of the University of Chicago, Illinois, United States of America. She previously held the positions of Dean of the School of Humanities, Vice Rector of Finance and Development, and President of the Research Committee of the University of the Aegean. And with that, Professor Vitsilaki, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, Honorable Minister, Honorable Ministers, uh, Mr. General Secretary, um, too much teaching, you can tell, has altered my voice. Um, it is a great pleasure and an honor to be here today on this auspicious, auspicious occasion of the signing ceremony uh, for the Sustainable Coastal and Maritime Tourism Research and Monitoring Center. Um, and of course, we are most happy and grateful to our ministry and uh, to the WTO for um, uh, working with us as an academic partner of this center, which is of utmost importance. Uh, what I want to outline are, in effect, uh, what as academics uh, we have seen today being stated by the majority of the discussion groups um, uh, between the policymakers, the global policymakers, and the industry leaders um, on coastal and maritime uh, tourism. Uh, the emphasis which has been given on sustainability has come to guide all of the discussions that we have seen from this morning, uh, and it is a discussion going on globally as well as locally. And it is important to understand, and it is clear among you, 
that uh, sustainability is not a trend. Sustainability is a necessity and a precondition for the continued growth uh, of our societies and our economies, and of course of the continued development of coastal and maritime tourism. We know that uh, maritime tourism is the key driver of growth, uh, and it has multiple implications, both for the marine environment uh, and for the calling destinations and for the societies uh, that host its activities. Uh, only at European level, we know that more than 60 to 65% uh, of um, uh, the jobs and 40 to 45% of the GDP of the blue economy is created by maritime uh, tourism. This uh, um, uh, contribution has become clear from your discussions as well that is very decisive, very decisive also at the micro level um, and especially when it comes to islands or smaller communities uh, where it is the main activity, the main productive activity. However, it became clear in your discussions as well that um, the focus on economic impact is not enough and it must not stray our attention away from recognizing the social implications as well as the environmental implications uh, of these activities. It is in this context that the concept of sustainability becomes that unifying concept that integrates the three major dimensions that need to be balanced. Economy, society, environment. Sustainability connotes the need to balance among the optimal use of environmental resources, securing economic viability, and preserving social authenticity of our communities. Our experience, however, does indicate, and it has been much noted today, that uh, this balance is quite difficult to achieve, and we don't always succeed in that. As a result, there has arisen uh, a great debate within the industry as well as in the communities uh, that there are negative effects of tourism, and especially of mass tourism, and that has generated stereotypes and a conceptual barrier to understanding the applicability of sustainable development. Very often we see that there has been a dichotomy in policy planning approaches uh, and uh, there are dilemmas posed between mass and uh, soft uh, tourist development. In all of this debate, we have come to realize that uh, one of the reasons is the lack of data necessary for evaluating the current state of the agencies involved and of the uh, destination's sustainability profile and for formulating the appropriate strategies and policies for the sector. We have also realized, and it is important to note, that sustainability is not a static goal but it is a moving target, constantly evolving as our experience in the field, as well as our knowledge uh, about the society in and the environment is advanced. So planning for sustainable development of maritime and coastal tourism must be seen as a uh, dynamic, a systemic approach aimed at shifting the destination system from one dynamic equilibrium between these parameters um, and with each other. That is, sustainable development, we must keep in mind that it is not a goal-based optimization framework, but it is a continuum guided by regional and global mission and vision, relying on continuous evaluation and assessment and feedback onto practice. As such, measuring and monitoring become critical components of securing maritime as well as um, destination sustainability. What we envision 
is that this knowledge uh, required, this process of evaluation and assessment continuously will be secured through the establishment and the functioning of the Center for Sustainable Maritime and Coastal Tourism. We take our shared goal to be the creation of a comprehensive system of knowledge and for recording and monitoring the sustainability of our agencies, our processes, and our destinations through the use of scientifically developed technologies and methodologies, and not only based on existing data, but primarily on expanding the range of the data selected, evaluated, and analyzed with direct involvement with industry experts as well as the local populations. You must know that the University of the Aegean, of which I have the honor of presiding, uh, already has an expertise that is well known to the World Tourism Organization, uh, as we have already established the sustainable university uh, which tries to minimize the negative environment of economic, societal, and health effects on a regional and global level. And we work towards sustainable uh, transformation, both of our academic community and our local communities. Our uh, research and what we suggest for our center is to follow the quintuple helix, as is known, which is a, fr a framework for transdisciplinary and interdisciplinary scientific analysis of sustainable development and social ecology. And it visualizes the collective interaction and exchange of knowledge between five subsystems which must act and react and interact. Education, academia, the economy, the natural environment, the political system, and policymakers and the civil society. That we have already applied in the Aegean Sustainable Tourism Observatory, which already operates under the auspices of the World Tourism Organization and is a member of the Global Network of Sustainable Tourism Observatories, uh, which deal with the development of methodologies for the improvement of documentation and its activities. Based on innovative research in tourism uh, as an interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary character and with the emphasis on sustainable development, we bring our living experience in the Aegean historic archipelago to the uh, center of maritime and coastal tourism so that we can work together with industry and policymakers to provide a comprehensive, coherent, applicable policy framework for a sustainable development of the maritime tourism sector and the management of destinations, and to develop the appropriate tools for strengthening territorial planning through effective monitoring. With the active involvement of mobilization of civil society, we can incite social innovation and industry innovation and raise awareness only, only, not only at the global but also at the local level, thus improving the knowledge of the public and their adaptiveness, acceptance, and resilience. In this way, our policies and our activities will acquire succinct identities and have multiplier effects upon advancing markets, societies, while protecting the environment we all live in. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we welcome back Antonia Timo. So now uh, I would like to introduce you to the second speaker, a person who committed and spent utmost efforts to fulfill the goal of establishing the research and monitoring center 
for coastal and maritime tourism in the Eastern Mediterranean. It is Dr. Yola Dionysopoulou, Director General of Tourism Policy of the Greek Ministry of Tourism. Dr. Dionysopoulou previously served as Director General for Higher Education at the Ministry of Education, Research and Religious Affairs. She holds a PhD in European Economics and Policy in Tourism from University of the Aegean, a postgraduate degree in International and European Studies from the National Capodistrian University of Athens, and a Master of Science in Public Economics and Policy. Dr. Dionysopoulou, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Dimu. Your Excellency, Honorable Mr. Zurapolikasvili, Secretary General of UNWTO. Your Excellency, Honorable Mr. Harry Theoharis, Minister of Tourism of the Hellenic Republic. Your Excellencies, Ministers, dear Honorable and Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. My dear Alessandra, it is our honor to welcome you all in Athens for the high-level conference on coastal and maritime tourism. In this fantastic boat, and thank you for this. Coastal tourism has, in effect, spurred the economic development of coastal and insular areas in the Mediterranean region for several decades, offering an important source of income and changing the livelihoods of local communities. The European Commission has identified coastal and maritime tourism sector as an area with special potential to foster a smart, sustainable and inclusive Europe and has put it at the heart of EU's blue growth strategy. However, high visitor volumes within a limited time span and within specific geographical areas increase pressure on natural resources and diminishing the visitor's experience. Moreover, tourism expenditure is not always evenly distributed along the tourism value chain and often eludes the local community. The COVID-19 crisis has brought international tourism almost to a halt. The pandemic escalated challenges already latent in tourism. It made visible the vulnerabilities endemic to coastal tourism, such as over-tourism and seasonality. The pandemic has a lasting impact by changing consumer patterns, bringing traveling closer to home and making international travelers more sensitive to issues of health, safety and green tourism. We are obliged to accelerate change for the sector to recover, coastal tourism must endorse the principles of sustainability. We need to take a step forward with new practices that will make the sector more resilient in the future. Diversification lies at the heart of resilience. To increase coastal and insular destinations, to create new destinations in the mainland, to establish synergies between coastal and maritime tourism and local economic activities is among our core priorities in our roadmap in ministry with uh, the minister's uh, Harris Theo Harris direction. These are among our core priorities in our roadmap for, for transformate the tourism product. Cooperation is also a key word for the future, to reconcile visitors and the tourism industry with local communities and encourage for responsive tourism. It is crucial to invest in the institutional capital by enhancing an inclusive and holistic approach in governance. This involves working with stakeholders from other government bodies, other economic sectors, as well as working in a coordinated manner with stakeholders across spatial levels. 
Regarding social sustainability, it is also about involving the local community in planning and implementation. Coastal tourism has therefore a long-term impact on the economy, the natural and built environment, the local population and on visitors themselves, which needs to be measured and monitored. We strongly believe in this new and ambitious endeavor to establish the research and monitoring center for coastal and maritime tourism in the Mediterranean, based largely on the scope and objectives put forward by UNWTO's work on sustainability, the overall objective of the Centre is to better monitor and manage the sustainable development of coastal and maritime tourism in the Mediterranean region. Research will focus on assessing the economic, environmental and social impact of tourism activities on coastlines. This will serve as a basis for the subsequent drafting of recommendations for governance to the benefit of destinations. It is our aim to cooperate and work together to develop a methodology for the measuring the impact of maritime and coastal tourism to ensure coastal and maritime sustainable tourism development in the region is monitored on a regular basis by a permanent structure engaging policy makers, academia, and industry stakeholders. To provide recommendations for the development of policies and practices, to enhance capacity building in coastal destinations on the management and planning, to build a strong network among the research and monitoring center for coastal and maritime tourism and the national, regional entities of sustainable tourism development in order to exchange know-how and expertise on specific and relevant indicators of common interest. We've already taken important steps towards our goal. We're working closely together with our esteemed academic partner, the University of Virginia, to define our areas of cooperation and build the proper data methodology. In this framework, the Ministry has also conducted extensive consultation with local, national and Mediterranean stakeholders from April to May to 2021. Stakeholders gathered around to discuss the challenges for the sustainable development of coastal and maritime tourism in Greece and the Mediterranean region. Our aim was to raise awareness and build consensus on the need for effective monitoring and measuring of coastal and maritime tourism. They acknowledged the added value of the research center to identify data already available and to collect and aggregate data across a number of tourism branches to provide reliable timely and relevant data for the benefit of the industry and destinations alike, to pinpoint challenges for different industry branches and different types of destination, to act as a hub of cooperation, exchange of good practices and know-how for collecting and processing data concerning coastal and maritime tourism in the region. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, changes towards sustainability and resilience mostly due to an institutional challenge. The need to plan ahead and to remain firm during years of implementation. It all starts with governance and we are committed to playing our part. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be commencing very soon with the signing ceremony. In the meantime, we wanted to inform each and every one of you that at the end of this presentation, we will be dividing you into different groups and you will be able to experience the Celebrity Apex at its best. We're going to have one team going with the, uh, the Vice President of Marine Operations, Captain Manolis. We'll be having another team going uh, with our uh, wonderful executives and officers. And another team going, of course, with our wonderful executives and officers as well, since we have many here tonight. It's going to be a wonderful tour. You will be able to experience the Celebrity Apex at its best. And we also have a special surprise for you in Eden on deck number five with our production cast singers, dancers, and specialty performers. I'm really looking forward to seeing each and every one of you right there in uh, just a few time. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we should now proceed with the signing ceremony. Your Excellency, Minister of Tourism of the Hellenic Republic, Mr. Harry Theo Harris, Mr. Secretary General of the UNWTO, Zorab Kolyolikasvili, please come to the floor for the signing ceremony. So now we'll move uh, to the second uh, part. We'll, our second uh, part foresees the signing of a declaration of intent in the field of tourism between the ministries of tourism of Greece and Saudi Arabia. But before that, a keynote speech will be delivered by His Excellency Ahmed Al Khatib, Minister of Tourism of Saudi Arabia. Minister Al Khatib has over 25 years of experience in investment and financial services, during which he established, managed, and restructured a number of governmental agencies and companies. He's known for his ability to lead institutional transformation and achieve future visions efficiently and sufficiently. Your Excellency, the floor is yours. Thank you, good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, Your Excellencies, uh, Minister Harry Theo Harris, my friend, my friend, uh, Secretary General Zura, uh, I'm very happy to be here with you today, Captain. Congratulations on this beautiful ship. You know, I'm, I'm happy to be on this ship uh, before it sail, and I wish to be among the first to sail on this uh, beautiful ship. And it is uh, a very strong message to, uh, you know, presume uh, travel which is uh, needed for this industry. 35 million, I just met with uh, Pierre uh, Francisco, the chairman of SMC, and he said uh, 35 million uh, traveled on cruise uh, in 2019, and this is, uh, this is a very serious business and a big business. Uh, at the same time, you know, UNWTO and other agencies are expecting the number of travelers to double by 2030 from the 1.5 billion in 2019, which is the impound, to about 3, 3 billion. 3 billion means we might see uh, seven, 70 to 80 million travelers on cruise ship. So you are in the right business. Congratulations. <laughs> and uh, 
at the same time, these are opportunities, you know. Uh, more business, more travelers, uh, more tourists going and exploring all the world. We are blessed to be in this industry. We are connecting the nations and connecting the world. We uh, bring happiness. Uh, in 2015, I was the Minister of uh, Health. But that was the most disappointing job. Whenever I go to the uh, hospitals, they're all, you know, tired, ill, they have problems, they complain. Since I became a Minister of Tourism, whenever I meet my clients, they are happy and smiling and enjoying. Fa Finally, you know, I'm um, at the right industry and I would like to continue to be part of this. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we have to protect the planet. And I was very delighted when I heard from Pierre Francisco that this ship is very modern. They recycle the waste and they recycle the water. It used to be thrown on the ocean and it damaged the, the, the ocean. This resulted in, and the global warming resulted in losing 50% or half of the Grand Reef corals since 2015, where we are in a time to protect these corals. And I would like to maybe share with you some good news that uh, the uh, King Abdullah uh, University for Science and Technology in Jeddah, you know, found out a technology to plant and grow corals. And actually, we started exporting corals. Uh, Finally, we, uh, we can see that we can, we have the technology to uh, recreate the corals and protect them and, 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 and have the, uh, the people who come on the ship and, and others to enjoy the uh, uh, reefs and the coral, corals and the nature, uh, which is very, very important. In addition to this news, he told me, you know, they discovered the, in this ship, there is a technology where you don't disturb the dolphin, which is absolutely uh, amazing. You know, uh, you can enjoy the dolphins, you know, sailing and around this beautiful ship uh, without any threats. Uh, you know, uh, the uh, protect, uh, protecting the environment, opportunity, the business will grow, the demand on cruise will grow. 40% of the people traveled in one, 2019 traveled for sun and sea, and maritime is part of the sun and sea uh, business. And this is the biggest category in, in, in our industry. In Europe, 60% traveled for uh, sun and sea and, and, and coast. Uh, you know, uh, Europe uh, 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 travelers, they, they, they enjoy the uh, beaches and the sea and the activities and the coast ship. Therefore, uh, the business absolutely will continue to grow. And these are, as I said, the opportunities. And now we need to make the uh, business and the planet sustainable through protecting the environment. I'm happy to share with you that we are investing in the Red Sea. The Red Sea uh, have been closed for this kind of business. I don't think it is attractive enough for uh, a ship of this size. For another ship, uh, Pierre told me, uh, that they are launching in 2022 that can carry 7,000 and another vessel which will, that will be launched soon can carry 10,000. This is big. But, uh, you know, um, uh, the SMC and the Carnival and the Silver Sea and the other uh, cruise operators see the Red Sea is not attractive enough for them because the business, the volume is not uh, is not enough, but finally we launched the Red Sea last year with the first ever Silver Sea uh, vessel. It was extremely successful, uh, and and this year we are we are launching the mainstream with the SMC uh, and the uh, luxury offering the the luxury yachts to uh, make the people enjoy the beautiful Red Sea. Red Sea is. Uh, 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 a bay, an area or a sea or that is undiscovered, untouched, and many people, I'm, I'm sure, like you, would love to go and explore it. 
Today it is virgin, nothing much to see on the coast. But in, by 2025, 2027, uh, you will see a lot. In the next 10 years, Saudi Arabia, the government of Saudi Arabia have already announced to invest more than $500 billion to build destinations at the, at the Red Sea. You know, hoping and aiming to add at least 20 million visits to the Red Sea by 2030 starting from the Jeddah downtown, which is in Jeddah, a big city, all the way to the Virgin Islands of the Red Sea, 50 Virgin Islands. I was astonished and amazed when I visited the island. It is untouched. Uh, we are trying to uh, impose all the regulations and the rules and create new regulations that will protect the environment at the Red Sea and the Red Sea Islands. And then going north to uh, the Amala, Amala project, which is a seven stars destination. And then near to Al Aqaba, the uh, Neom project, which is uh, a completely ammunition free and uh, environment friendly. Uh, where people can enjoy the, uh, uh, the, the Neom. In a matter of fact, one of the islands in Neom will be ready to host you in June next year. We started the construction. We completed the master plan and we started construction. So we started de delivering and adding to the destinations in Saudi Arabia and to the world a new destination very soon. I, we have to balance. We heard from the uh, professors and the doctors who wants to protect the environment. And you are listening to the uh, investment expert or investment person who wants to invest these assets. So we need to meet somewhere where we make money from these assets that God blessed us with, but in the same time satisfy the professors and protect the environment. And we will definitely continue to work with them to reach to that point. Uh, I wish uh, all the best for all of us. And I thank you again, Harry, for inviting me to this beautiful, beautiful two days in, in the great uh, uh, Greece. Uh, you are relaunching and restarting tourism. I wish you all the best. And we are all behind you. And thank you, Secretary General, my friend. And thank you all. Thank you. We will now proceed with the signing of a declaration of intent in the field of tourism between the ministries of tourism of Greece and Saudi Arabia for the exchange of expertise and cooperation in the areas of sustainable tourism and sustainable coastal and maritime tourism. Minister of uh, Tourism of the Hellenic Republic, I invite you to deliver a few closing remarks. Well, I think everything has been said and done, so uh, there's not much point in reiterating things that we said already. I think the important thing is 
the willingness to cooperate. I think that's what we saw in the signing, uh, in the discussions, uh, our dear friends, Blendy, Rita, uh, Orit, uh, Zurab, Savas, uh, did I forget anyone? Hope I didn't. Um, is a testament of the willingness of people to travel and the willingness of people um, to restart and rebalance their lives. We have done as much as we could during the past few months to make this possible. We have committed to do as much as we can in the next few months to make this possible. Um, I'm very glad that uh, I see the same spark in my colleagues' eyes. Um, I see the same willingness uh, to cooperate, to sign a re real um, um, agreements. And of course, I'm very grateful both to the industry, um, Mr. Vago, and Captain and Captain Manolis and all the uh, people that support us to make this possible. I'm also grateful to the academia, to Director uh, Vizilaki, who will be the driving force in the actual research and the actual work that needs to be done. I'm sure that great uh, times, greater times than the ones that we have to endure, will lie ahead and we will make everything possible in order to make those good times be realized. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much once again, Mr. Peo Harris. Ladies and gentlemen, we kindly invite you to join us on a wonderful tour of this celebrity apex. We're going to be starting with our ministers and all our VIPs on board. You will be escorted by our own VIPs, and we'll be looking forward to meeting you right outside of the theater. Have a wonderful day on board the Celebrity Apex. Thank you so much for joining us. Today has been such a spectacular day, and we're so grateful and blessed to have you all here on board for this great day.